strange thing, but I feel as I breathe, I have danced. I've never known life without dance. So for me, the sense of imagination was a world within. And the bridge to those two worlds, this one and that one, was dance. But dance was always there. It was never a choice. I was never given a choice. People say, ask, you know, say, so what age did you make the decision? I didn't. It was always going to be a part of my life. Before the support of Akram, uh, Bhaiya and uh, Anand, I have to say that massive support was my gurus. Chitra Leka Bola, Nilima Devi, Chaya Kanvate, Shamak Davar. These people basically shaped me, helped shape a rough diamond. diamond. And I think, but there's a whole world, you know, an ocean that they gave me. And through that ocean, I had the power to draw up and create a tsunami and go forward. It's difficult to summarize, but when I see Chitra Didi, when I was living in Birmingham, now I have a house and all of this around me. And I feel so, so lucky. But I never had a house. I moved 26 houses. My whole house was in a, in a plastic bag. That was it. I had a little suitcase and a plastic bag which was full of cassettes. That was my whole life. And I moved from um, pillar to post. And when I lived in Birmingham with my grandmother in a very rundown area in Spark Brook, I always felt like the sun never shined in that area. Chitra Didi was like this beacon of light. When you look at her, Regardless of what she's going through, you see this humongous smile on her. You know, massive smile and her energy of giving. So she was like this lighthouse which used to guide me from Spark Brook and bring me towards her. And that's what made life worth living. In a place and a time where I had absolutely nothing and no one. Didi, Nilima Didi, has seen me grow up since I was an eight-year-old boy. You know, in many aspects, my parents weren't so involved in my life. So Didi became like a mother for me, you know. Aridikra Kaile. Or have this, eat this, do this, do this. And any milestone I achieved, I felt like she had pride. I would forget about it, but she felt something. You know, she shared half my journey with me in life since I was an eight-year-old child. If they did not give up what they had given up and started things from this grassroots level, we wouldn't be able to do half the things that we're doing today. So I am grateful. I mean, that's an understatement for me. These, these two, uh, my gurus have been, <coughs> they've been everything for me. But I also have to mention my gurus in India as well, Shamak as well, who taught me what real professionalism is. You know, there was, there, was no, there was no excuse, there was no second best. You had to be professional in whatever you do. There was 40, 50, 60 dancers on stage. If you didn't do something, you were moved. But that tough love that he gave us taught us to do our best always. So I have to really thank him for that sense of professionalism that he gave me. And in a strange way, I find he gave me a lot of spirituality. He opened my spiritual world. Which is strange because coming from a classical discipline and then going into Bollywood, where, why was I going to find spirituality in Bollywood? But I found a huge sense of opening and spirituality in his world that I had never found anywhere else. I always say Rising was my university in contemporary dance. Never trained as a contemporary dancer and I felt like working with Akram Khan, Sidi Larbi, Russell Maliphant, felt like I was absorbing more as a student than as a performer. So they were basically giving me my axe and my chisel, you know, <laughs> to, to these tools to use to then to start sculpting my own things. L Rising was one of those things where I felt it was against many odds, working with three m really massive names, being quite young myself at that point with no contemporary training at all. And also Anand as well, my producer. I think it's really important to mention him. It was his idea. He spoke to um, Akram Bhaiya and he said, um, you know, I think uh, Akram Bhaiya said, I'll create a solo on Akash, just five minutes using hands, only hands. Um, but Anand said, thank you, but no thank you, because um, we can't do anything with five minutes. So he was then asked, well, what do you suggest? So Anand said, I think I believe in threes and I think three choreographers should make three pieces on him. Um, so Akram Bea said, who? That's when Anand 
dropped the bomb and said, uh, Akram Khan, Sidi Larbi and Rasul Malafan. And first reaction of Akram Bey was, no, 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 you can't. I'm not, Akash is not contemporary trained. Um, but Anand said, no, I think you should give him a chance. His body is a bit different. And that's where the journey started. Akram Bhaiya, I mean, he was like an older brother and had so much respect for him. Uh, and for, him, for me, it was as simple as, you know, he would say something and I would go 150% in that direction. Because I felt like he's the one who came most closest to my world. Um, so there was this other sort of respect and trust in him in that way. And I, when I worked in contemporary, and then I had knowledge, a little bit of knowledge of Kathak and Bharatnatyam, and then I had worked in the commercial sec sector with Shamak, I felt like this created a palette of colours that I was then able to use to express the images that I saw in my mind. And I think contemporary again then became a vessel for me to speak a language with an audience that didn't speak Tamil or Bridge Basha or Urdu or Hindi. I felt like it became a vessel to be able to communicate with people who don't come from my subcontinent. And I think dance also for me shouldn't always just be limited to the geography that it belongs to. And I feel that this world of Kathak, Bharatanatyam contemporary, were these trees that used to be in different parts in this, you know, in this field. And I feel those roots got closer to each other and now they're able to exchange and trade different skills and ideologies and philosophies between each other and almost creating a hybrid plant through those three things. I felt like all my previous teachings when I was working with Hu became the language without words for me because he didn't speak English, I didn't speak Chinese. Sometimes we had a translator, sometimes we didn't. But at a point, it was so incredible that even when the translator was there, he would talk in Chinese and I, and I would translate to the translator saying he said this and we would all laugh and he would understand what I said because the synergy became as such. You know, it was incredible and I feel like in classical dance you're, and as an artist your job is to understand also your audience and the people who you're trying to communicate with. Communication is super important to read the energy of the people, the atmosphere, what's happening around you. And I suppose we use that sixth sense between us to be able to communicate. And dance for me, these worlds of Kathak, Bharatanatyam, contemporary were these sort of pathways uh, that allowed me to read uh, the human body and communicate. So for me, the, the, the dance training had come to a point where now I felt like I didn't need language as such. I could truly communicate without language, especially in this situation with, with who. It was interesting because it's about a Chinese monk who did a journey from China all the way to India to retrieve original Buddhist scriptures. It took him 14 years, this journey, to do that. And it was inspired by the novel Journey to the West. It's a very, it's, it's like the Mahabharata, it's like an epic in China. Sara is about life and death, life and death, and the continuous cycle of life and death and everything that comes in between this wheel. So in the production, <coughs> we use sand. You know, there's falling sand, because I like this image of footprints in sand. And I felt like, when I place myself in the monk's body, I felt like I see the footprints in front of me and I feel like I've been here before. These two years has also changed for me massively. I mean, I've lost so many people uh, I've, lo I, I've, I've loved. I think during the COVID period, for me to be honest with you, Sanjeevani, it was a blessing. Because it's the first time that I was allowed to stop. That I wasn't worried that there's a show next month. Or, oh no, you know, I have to like lose four kilos before I go on stage again in three weeks. I wasn't pressured in that way. For the first few months, it was incredible. I would get up at five in the morning, three, three in the morning, four in the morning, do, you know, pray, meditate and go in the fields, walk. And I, it was time to absorb the world and what it was saying. Je suis was such an interesting process uh, because you know, it started with me going to Istanbul, feeling like I've been here before. Another one of those weird Akash things, like, feels very familiar. Doing a workshop, and from a workshop, five years later comes a production. But it's that process of five years. And it was really interesting because here we picked up a very political subject, a very political topic, and then I'm not a political person at all. But in the process, I realized through the politics, 
humanity is removed. So there has to be a gap that is somehow bridged between speaking of the humanity within politics. Then we chose, you know, Turkey as this sort of hot spotted area because there was a lot of things happening exactly at the time we were we were creating hashtag Jusui in Turkey. But for me, if you take that same situation and put it in Afghanistan, it's almost a similar story. It's just the clothes change, the people change, the politics change, but the essence of this oppression is the same all around the world. And then for me, there was this sense of, hang on, what I'm seeing on the ground in Turkey is very different to what I see. Or when I go to the refugee camps in Greece, it's very different to what I see on the media. So I felt like there was a lot of media manipulation. So I felt like, how can we then tell a story in real time that's not recorded, that's not edited, that's there in that moment, using people who have actually lived that experience. So for me, it wasn't about getting a dancer who can dance, but it was about having people who are in that situation, who have lived it and who are going to dance it, but who are also then reflective of what's happening in terms of oppression around the world. And I mean, there was that image where the Gizam gets wrapped up in cling film. You know, they, they wrap her and wrap her in cling film and it's like she's suffocating. And that's always an image, I think, that really stays with people who come and watch Jusui. They always talk about how does she breathe in there. But it's interesting, she can't breathe, but you feel you can't breathe as, as an audience member. And that sense of suffocation is equally felt in that moment. Empathy is, you're on the same platform. It's no longer, it's no longer us and them. It's us in that moment. I think art gives you permission to be odd, to express what's going on inside you that is formless, that is shapeless. You know, it gives you the, the power to be able to do something which is abnormal and absurd, but it feels right. It allows you to go on the path of your own feeling. And I think that's what's beautiful about any art or any artistic endeavor or piece.